many of the familiar faces in this room know, we always commence our proceedings here at Government House by acknowledging the traditional owners in their language, Bujiri Gamarua, Dian Babana Gamarada. We are on Gadigal land and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. There are moments in one's life when an event so concentrates the mind that it's forever fixed in one's consciousness. For some in this room, it would have been JFK's assassination. For most of us, September the 11th. But often it's a far less dramatic moment. For me, one of those latter occasions was the first time that I heard John Bell do a reading of Shakespeare. I remember exactly where it was. It was a dinner at the University of Sydney in the late 1970s. So transfixed was I by his delivery that as I speak now, I cannot actually quite bring to mind the piece that you delivered, John. But can I say I was hooked, if not on all of Shakespeare at that time, certainly on any of John Bell's performances. It was his vision that brought into our midst the Bell Shakespeare Company which over its nearly 35 year history has matured into a premier arts institution and a leading Shakespearean performance company. We are blessed. But why is this so important? Indeed, why is Shakespeare even relevant some four centuries after his plays were written and performed? Now that's probably a rhetorical question given the number of biographies of Shakespeare, the books written about his works, and what must be the million of performances of his plays. But Shakespearean scholar Harold Bloom sees Shakespeare as not a mere observer of the human condition, but actually as the inaugurator of that condition. In his 1998 work, Shakespeare, Inventing the Human, Bloom wrote, Shakespeare will go on explaining us in part because he invented us. Thus, when in 1889, Oscar Wilde wrote that life imitates art, far more than art imitates life, he was, I would suggest, echoing Jacques, as in, as you like it, in one of Shakespeare's most quoted observations, all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. Coming from a melancholic ruminator, as Jacques is, or was, this soliloquy draws the listener into what seems to be a, a, a meditation on the misery of life. After all, none of the ages of man he then runs through, comparing them to acts of a play, sounds like very much fun. Take old age, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, and that final age, one's dotage, you can all say it. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. And as you like it, it's one of Shakespeare's comedies. <laughs> I first found my Shakespeare home in his comedies, probably as an antidote to studying King Lear, one of his three great tragedies, at school. There are, of course, his other two great tragedies, Macbeth and Julius Caesar, in which we find Shakespeare's unravelling of the human spirit so cleverly crafted through both language and history. Take Macbeth, for example, which introduced the word assassination into the English language. In Julius Caesar, which was written at a time following a series of a rel a religiously motivated assassination attempts on the life of Elizabeth I, Shakespeare understood the power of the brevity of language. As a lawyer, I love it. A you brute. Nothing more needed to be said. But of John Bell, there is much to be said. Tonight, we have the extraordinary privilege of hearing from an individual whose knowledge of Shakespeare's plays, both as text and perhaps more importantly as performance, is unequaled in this country, probably in the English-speaking world. He has been pivotal in making accessible to countless audiences those rich experiences that the plays embody. He established a company that has educated, enriched and expanded our world. I thought, however, 
that much could be understood of this consummate artist who has played such a seminal role in Australian theatre and in modern Australian thought by reference to his university friends and contemporaries and his sometime housemates. The names are a litany of the movers and shakers of the 1970s in the arts, in literature and in journalism. There were political activists and political commentators. The group included Clive James, Jermaine Greer, Bruce Beresford, Ken Haller, Mungo McCullum, of whom it is reported that Gough Whitlam described as a tall, bearded descendant of lunatic aristocrats. <laughs> Gough did have a flair for the magisterial statement. There was also Richard Werrett, John Gaydon, Laurie Oakes, and Les Murray, and many others. It's not surprising, therefore, to find that the title, the title of tonight's presentation is, in what is this now the ninth iteration of Ideas at the House, held in collaboration with the Royal Society of New South Wales, for whom we thank. The title is Shakespeare on Politics, What Can We Learn? Ladies and gentlemen, John Bell. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, and good evening, everybody. Uh, I guess we're all quite happy to see the end of 2023. It was a pretty bumpy year all around, um, not just the uh, record-breaking climate change events uh, all over the world, fires, floods, droughts and pollution. But we had the ongoing horrors of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the ghastly war in Gaza which apparently uh, has images that are too dreadful to broadcast, let alone to contemplate. And I'm afraid this year isn't looking a great deal better so far. Plus, we have the American elections coming up. <laughs> so buckle up, it could be a bumpy ride. I don't know about you, but I often wake up in the mornings and think, um, what new horrors await us? What is the latest Thing we have inflicted on ourselves. Um, what, what, what damage have we done? What aggression uh, or, or torture or cruelty? We really are a rotten species. Why don't we just drop the bomb and give the place back to the cockroaches? And that's early morning thoughts, you know. And then I, then I stop and think, hang on, hang on. We've also produced Socrates and Shakespeare and Mozart, Bach and Beethoven. We have produced Isaac Newton and Einstein, Angela Merkel, Marie Curie, Stephen Hawking, Abraham Lincoln, Emmeline Pankhurst, Martin Luther King, Mum Sherl, Eddie Marbo, Nelson Mandela, and Greta Thunberg, and that late, great Russian patriot, Alexei Navalny. So we aren't a lost cause after all. We have achieved wonderful things and we are capable of making a wonderful world. But on dark days, the, for, the forces of ignorance, bitterness, hatred, and outdated ideologies do seem about to overwhelm us. So we need heroes and heroines, uh, inspirational figures who will give us, by example, the courage and the will to carry on. I have my own pantheon of such people, and I find they're often risk-takers, people who have dared to break the mold, uh, challenge tradition, and ask, why not? And I find that many of my personal heroes are the ones who failed, uh, who push the boundaries too hard, too soon. But their sacrifices made breakthroughs possible. I think of Giordano Bruno, burned at the stake in Rome. Galileo, who was threatened with the same fate for defying the church and declaring that the sun, not the earth, was the center of our universe. I think of poor Vincent van Gogh, who sold one painting in his life to his brother, Theo, who felt sorry for him. The rest he couldn't give away. Just give me the cost of the paint, he would beg, but no one wanted them. Today, of course, his paintings are worth millions of dollars. Not that the price tag is any proof of quality, it just shows that we have at last caught up with Van Gogh and we can see the brilliance and originality of his mind. I think of Georges Bizet, whose opera Carmen was booed off stage at its first performance. The critics were outraged. Operas should be about noble people with lofty sentiments. How dare you write an opera about a gypsy girl and her sordid affair with a Toreador and a common soldier? Bizet died a few months later of a broken heart, never to know that Carmen would be the most popular opera ever written. I think of the courage and the doggedness of Ludwig van Dathen, 
Beethoven, who started going stone deaf at the age of 23. But he continued to churn out some of the greatest music of the modern age, even though he never got to hear it. After conducting one of his great symphonies, he stood facing the orchestra and had to be turned around to see that the audience was on its feet and cheering. But of all the great artists I admire, the one who's had the greatest impact on my life and career is the dramatist and poet William Shakespeare, whom I first encountered as a 14-year-old schoolboy. And shortly after making that acquaintance, I declared, I'm going to be an actor and perform Shakespeare for the rest of my life, which is more or less what I've done. Now, so what is it about Shakespeare that so inspires me? And let's remember that inspire literally means to take in a breath. You open your mouth, you see something wonderful, and you breathe it in. Inspiration. I think the first thing that uh, inspires me about Shakespeare is his curiosity. He was a true Renaissance man, and he was curious about everything, about nature, about science, history, about politics, the law and exploration, about language, but mainly about people. He had an extraordinary insight into human nature and an empathy with people of all ages and social classes. Before Shakespeare, the characters in English drama were figures uh, of stereotypes, young lovers, uh, smiling villains, tyrant king, noble hero, etc. But Shakespeare rejected such simplistic and fixed, predetermined characters and said, we're not determined by our star signs or by our chemical makeup. We are indeed a bundle of contradictions, conflicting urges and impulses, predictable in nothing except our inconsistencies. The American academic, Harold Bloom, who we just heard quoted, said that Shakespeare invented personality. Shakespeare could put himself with equal ease into the mind of a 14-year-old girl, a crazy old king, or a pathological killer. He could identify with all of them. As a schoolboy at Stratford Grammar, he was taught to debate in Latin and Greek and plead either side with equal conviction. Great training for a dramatist. He could always see both sides of any moral dilemma. But from early on, he developed a habit of taking sides with the underdog, the outsider, for instance, black people were unpopular in London at the time. Uh, they were equated with uh, the sons of darkness, sons of the devil. Queen Elizabeth herself complained, too many Negroes have crept into our kingdom. Yet Shakespeare makes Othello his most sympathetic tragic hero, the victim of racial and, hat and, and hatred and envy. Caliban, the so-called monster in The Tempest, is given the play's most poignant poetry, he loves the island that has been taken away from him and is the only one to appreciate its beauty. A wave of anti-Semitism swept through London as a result of a trumped-up Jewish plot against the Queen. Shakespeare's rival, Christopher Marlowe, rushed into print with a vicious anti-Semitic play called The Jew of Malta, and Shakespeare quickly responded with the comedy The Merchant of Venice, in which another Jewish character is central to the play, Shylock, the moneylender. But here, the Jew is depicted as a victim of abuse and persecution, especially at the hands of Antonio, the Christian merchant. When asked why he wants revenge on Antonio, Shylock replies, he hath disgraced me and hindered me at half a million, laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heated my enemies. And what's his reason? I'm a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions? Fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is? If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If I'm like you in the rest, I will be like you in that. What? If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what is his sufferance? By Christian example, why? Revenge. The villainy you teach me, I will execute. And it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. 
we know now that revenge is not an answer to anything. We can see by what's happening in Gaza that revenge only breeds revenge. Refugees were also unwelcome in London, which was flooded with Huguenots fleeing Catholic persecution in France. They were met with hostile crowds and the old familiar chant, they've come here to take our jobs. There were violent demonstrations and attacks on the hapless refugees, and Shakespeare addressed the issue in his play, Sir Thomas More. Now this speech is of great significance, not only for its content, but because it's the only surviving page of manuscript we have in Shakespeare's own hand. And here, Sir Thomas More confronts the uh, rioters who want all the so-called strangers removed from England. Grant them removed. And grant that this your noise hath chid down all the majesty of England. Imagine that you see the wretched strangers, their babies at their backs and their poor luggage, plodding to the ports and coasts for transportation. And that you sit as kings in your desires, authority quite silent by your brawl, and you in rough of your opinions clothed. What had you got? I'll tell you. You had taught how insolence and strong hand should prevail. How order should be quelled. And by this pattern, not one of you should live an aged man. For other ruffians, as their fancies wrought, with self-same same, self, same hand, self-reason, and self-right, would shark on you. And men like ravenous fishes would feed on one another. What country, by the nature of your error, should give you harbour? Why, you must needs be strangers. How would you please feel to find a nation of such barbarous temper that breaking out in hideous violence would not afford you an abode on earth? Spurn you like dogs, wet their attested knives against your throats. Would you be pleased to have such, to be such used? This is the stranger's case, and this your mountainish inhumanity. Speaks very pertinent to our times, I think, as we see far-right candidates in Germany and the USA promising to deport asylum seekers. Another of the aspects of Shakespeare that most inspires me is the range of his work. Most of us can write one sort of book or play. You'll know what I mean by a typical Agatha Christie or Stephen King, even a typical Noel Coward or Tennessee Williams. But there's no such thing as a typical Shakespeare. Of his 38 surviving plays, there aren't two alike. He wrote tragedies, comedies, romances, historical dramas, knockabout farces, and magical fairy tales. But even within those genres, no two plays are alike. Each of his comedies, for instance, stands alone and bears no resemblance to any of the others in tone or expression. And this is a tribute to his wide-ranging imagination. Not only could he imagine a moonlit forest, a blasted heath in Scotland, a sunny forest of Arden, a freezing castle in Denmark, or a fantasy island in the Caribbean, he could bring them all to life without scenery, in broad daylight, on the open-air stage of the globe. And people would believe him. Ill-met by moonlight, proud Titania. The air bites shrewdly, it is very cold. But look, the morn in russet mantle clad walks o'er the dew of yon high eastern hill. Shakespeare's imagination fired the imaginations of the 2,000 people crammed into the globe and they went on the journey with him. Imagination is the prime driver of all successful enterprises. I recall an interview with Paul Keating in which he said, if you can't imagine a new economic landscape, if you can't imagine a new social landscape or international one, then there's no way you're going to get one. If the creativity is not there, if the artistry is not there, the outlook will be meager and dull. Art, music, poetry and drama. These are the elements which nourish our imaginations, which otherwise would lie dormant. And what fires imagination? It's a sense of wonder, as if seeing things for the first time, the way a child does. We know the delight of watching a child experience something wonderful for the first time, a Christmas tree, a birthday present, a new puppy, a trip to the circus. Wide-eyed and open-mouthed, they breathe it in, inspiration. 
We take joy in seeing them, have that experience, and may, may remind us that we become somewhat jaded and nonchalant in taking such things for granted. We've seen it all before. An artist is somebody whose sense of wonder of seeing things for the first time is not jaded, doesn't become nonchalant, but is constantly alert to the beauty, the horrors, the absurdity, the bliss, the miracle of everyday life. If we keep an open mind and an open heart, we can share that experience and see life anew through the eyes of the artist. Was Shakespeare a risk taker? He certainly was. Sometimes his dabbling in politics came too close to the bone. His play Richard II showed a weak monarch being deposed by his feisty cousin. It struck a nerve with Queen Elizabeth, who was being threatened by her cousin, Mary Queen of Scots. Know you not, she stormed, that I am Richard II. The play was banned, and Shakespeare and his fellow actors were called before a tribunal, and some fast talking by friends at court saved his neck. His rival, Ben Jonson, castigated him for breaking the rules of classical theatre, which prescribed that a drama should take place in real time in the one place, like the ancient Greek tragedies. But Shakespeare flaunted the rules by having the action take place in multiple locations, sometimes over large gaps in time, thus revolutionising the whole nature of drama. All of Shakespeare's plays are still regularly performed, Ben Jonson's only rarely. Shakespeare's whole career was one of experiment, revolution, and breaking the rules, challenging his audience. Over a lifetime spent working in the theatre, founding and running two theatre companies, I've learned quite a lot about leadership from studying Shakespeare's plays and characters. Julius Caesar is a virtual playbook of the do's and don'ts of leadership. In the play's tussle for leadership, we can see why some succeed and others fail. For instance, take Julius Caesar himself, a brilliant military commander, a ruthless politician, great orator, who's undone by overweening ambition. His arrogance and aloofness mean that he's, he's not moving with the times. He has a thin ear, tin ear and can't hear the signs of conspiracy happening all around him. He allows flatterers to steer him away from reality and refuses to listen to sound advice. His antagonist, Brutus, may be the noblest Roman of them all, but he too has his flaws. Proud of his reputation for honesty and integrity, he has no tolerance for weakness in others and dismisses their opinions. He is too secure in his opinion of himself. His friend Cassius, on the other hand, is too lacking in self-confidence and allows himself to be overruled by Brutus even when he knows that Brutus is wrong. Mark Antony is a brilliant spin doctor and a manipulator of public opinion, a supremely tricky orator. But having got the top job, he whistles it away through self-indulgence and laziness. It's not enough to get to the top job. You have to have the flexibility and the self-control to stay there. Coriolanus is another instructive figure from Roman history, a brilliant fighting machine. He is a nightmare in peacetime, a man who refuses to compromise or negotiate and so is easy pickings for the politicians who seek to destroy him. General George Patton springs to mind. Shakespeare's 11 history plays give us more graphic examples of good and bad leadership. We witness the destruction of Richard II, who puts his faith in divine right and entitlement. We see the demise of his successor, Henry IV, who, plagued with guilt for the murder of his predecessor and believes that the proper posture for a king is aloofness and austerity. He makes a major mistake by being ungrateful to those who've helped him attain the crown, thereby breeding resentment and rebellion. His son, Henry V, the most charismatic and successful of Shakespeare's monarchs, has learned by watching his father's mistakes and sets about crafting his image from an early age. He spends his adolescence in London's pubs and brothels, partly so that he may dazzle the world by his eventual reformation, but also that so he may get to know the people he will reign over. He wants to know their names, how they live, what they think. He's adept at de developing the common touch. As soon as he is king, he sets about making himself a national hero by declaring war on France 
and blackmailing the church into giving him its blessing. At first his campaign goes well, with Henry exhibiting such sterling leadership qualities as tenacity, endurance, strategic thinking, discipline, and a contagious optimism. But as he advances deeper into French territory, his troops are beset by illness, fatigue, and depletion in numbers. He gets as far as Agincourt, where he finds himself outnumbered five to one by a French army, well armed and itching for battle. And this is where Henry's true leadership comes to the fore. He realizes that stirring speeches and grand rhetoric aren't going to win the day. He has to find a language that is homely and simple. He has to call his troops by name and convince them that they are a band of brothers. And they are actually lucky to be here, to participate in such a glorious victory. He can't offer them reinforcements or full bellies or warm coats. He can offer them something better, immortality. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbours and say, tomorrow is St. Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispian's day. Old men forget and all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile, this day will gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England, now abed, will think themselves accursed they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap, whilst any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's day. And the rest, of course, is history. The speech works its magic, and Henry's troops go on to win one of the greatest military victories in English history. Having spent the bulk of my life running two theatre companies, the Nimrod and then Bell Shakespeare, I reckon I've learned a lot of valuable lessons about leadership by studying Shakespeare's plays and characters. These lessons include listening to people, empathising with their situations, not taking myself too seriously, leading from the front but as part of the team, staying loyal, trustworthy, resilient, positive, optimistic, generous with praise and grateful for support, bold but responsible in risk-taking. I don't say I've always succeeded in all of the above, but at least I know the lessons are there to be learned. Shakespeare's plays have lasted 400 years and are still performed the world over in almost every language. One reason they've lasted so long is that in a sense, they remain unfinished. Shakespeare asks lots of searching questions in his plays, but he doesn't provide any answers. The plays never have a so-called message. They're never didactic, unlike Bertolt Brecht or George, Ber George Bernard Shaw. And many playwrights today writing with a particular social or political agenda. That means that each generation has to answer Shakespeare's questions in its own way. What do we think about racism? anti-Semitism, sexism, the patriarchy, ambition, revenge. The words remain the same. The words are the text. But the text is not the play. The play is what happens when actors pick up the text and start to perform it to each other. And that's where the answers, the attitudes, the responses will become manifest. The words are always the same, but the play is always different, always new, always now. And then we have language. Language is humankind's greatest invention, that which separates us from and allows us to dominate the rest of the animal kingdom. English has been the most successful to date of all the modern languages, and Shakespeare was one of those who shaped the English we speak today. English, more than most languages, is always in transition, 
New words and phrases are added to the lexicon every day, and other words and phrases become obsolete. In Shakespeare's day, the English language was experiencing a major explosion of invention and excitement. There was as yet no definitive English dictionary, so new words could be minted and mean whatever you wanted them to mean, especially with such a wide range of English dialects and accents. Most of us today have a vocabulary of about 10 to 20,000 words. Shakespeare had a vocabulary of about 60,000 words and introduced hundreds of new words and phrases into our language. We quote him all the time without realising it. In the words of Bernard Levin, if you cannot understand my argument and decide it's Greek to me, you are quoting Shakespeare. <laughs> if you claim to be more sinned against than sinning, you are quoting Shakespeare. If you recall your salad days, you are quoting Shakespeare. If you act more in sorrow than in anger. If your wish is father to the thought. If your property has vanished into thin air. If you are, uh, you are quoting Shakespeare. If you have ever refused to budge an inch or suffered from green-eyed jealousy. If you've been ever played fast and loose. If you have been tongue-tied, a tower of strength, hoodwinked or in a pickle. If you have knitted your brows, made a virtue of necessity, insisted on fair play, slept not one wink, stood on ceremony, danced attendance on your lord and master, laughed yourself into stitches, had short shrift, cold comfort, or too much of a good thing, if you have seen better days or lived in a fool's paradise, why, be that as it may, the more fool you, for it's a foregone conclusion that you are, as luck would have it, quoting Shakespeare. If you think that it's early days and uh, you clear out bag and baggage, if you think it's high time and that is the long and the short of it, if you believe that the game is up and that the truth will out, even if it involves your own flesh and blood, if you lie low till the crack of doom because you suspect foul play, if you set your teeth on edge at one fell swoop without rhyme or reason, then to give the devil his due, if the truth were known, for surely you have a tongue in your head, you are quoting Shakespeare, even if you bid me good riddance and send me packing, if you wish I was as dead as a doornail, if you think that I am an eyesore, a laughing stock, a devil incarnate, a stony-hearted villain, bloody-minded or a blinking idiot, then, by Jove, oh Lord, tut tut, for goodness sake, what the dickens, it's all one to me, for you are quoting Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> that was Bernard Levin's doing, not mine. <laughs> Apart from Shakespeare's comments on leadership, which I've, I spoke of earlier, what does he have to offer about when it comes to good governance and, and the safety of the realm? In Henry V, the archbishop depicts a, a medieval concept of order, but the king at the top and everyone else one step or other below on the ladder, each one fulfilling a function allotted to him at birth. Therefore doth heaven divide the state of man into diverse functions, setting endeavour in continuous motion, to which is fixed as an aim or but obedience. For so work the honeybees, creatures that by a rule in nature teach the act of order to a peopled kingdom. They have a king and officers of sorts, while some like magistrates correct at home, Others, like soldiers, armoured in their stings, make boot upon the summer's velvet buds, which pillage they with merry march bring home to the tent royal of their emperor, who, busied in his majesty, surveys the singing masons building roofs of gold, the civil citizens kneading up the honey, the poor mechanic porters crowding in their heavy burdens at his narrow gate, the sad-eyed justice with his surly hum, delivering o'er to executors pale, the lazy, yawning drone. It's a charming speech. The Archbishop, of course, is a major figure of the establishment, and we shouldn't be surprised about his uh, very medieval concept of order. Moreover, he's, the, he's under pressure from King Henry to find an ecclesiastical excuse for invading France, because if he doesn't, the church will lose half its property. So the Archbishop has very good reason to be the king's man. The law and order are paramount. But what about when you have a weak or tyrannous king? This is the dilemma that plagues all of Shakespeare's history plays. Henry V is a complex, rich and poetic play, not just a jingoistic spectacle. It was written at a time when England was just beginning to emerge as a global power and was facing off enemies in Spain and France. 
as well as rebellions in Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. Patriotism ran high. The play celebrates the Earl of Essex's defeat of the Irish rebels. And in one scene, Shakespeare brings together an Irishman, a Scot, a Welshman, and an Englishman in the trenches, attacking Harfleur. Naturally, a quarrel breaks out. But all is resolved when the trumpet sounds and they gather together under the flag of St. George. This is Shakespeare's image of the birth of a united kingdom. Naturally, the play was popular throughout the 19th century with the expansion of the English-British Empire. It was so again in periods of intense uh, patriotism during World War I and World War II. In fact, when Laurence Olivier played the role of Henry at London's Old Vic Theatre, he was visited by Winston Churchill, who reminded him, you are England. Olivier, who was at, in the Air Force at the time, was commissioned by the War Office to make a morale-boosting movie. So he chose Henry V, which was a great success. But to ensure its popularity, Olivier cut the more contentious scenes, such as Henry discarding or executing his old companions. During the Battle of Agincourt, as described by Shakespeare, Henry ordered all prisoners to be slaughtered in case they mounted a counterattack. Olivia cut that scene too. He just kept the glamorous, patriotic bits. Shakespeare's ambivalence towards war, in what Othello describes as the pride, pomp and circumstance of glorious war, is well expressed by a young soldier in Henry V. But if the cause be not good, the king himself hath a heavy, rec heavy reckoning to make. When all those legs and arms and heads chopped off in a battle, shall join together at the latter day and cry all, we died in such a place. Some swearing, some crying for a surgeon, some upon their wives left poor behind them, some upon the debts they owe, some upon their children rawly left. I'm afeard there are few die well that die in a battle. For how can they charitably dispose of anything when blood is their argument? Now, if these men do not die well, it'll be a black matter for the king that led them to it. War certainly has its horrors, and Shakespeare depicts them forensically in his three plays, The History of Henry VI. Civil war is the greatest of evils, and is well encaptured in the stage direction, enter a father who has killed his son, and a son who has killed his father. The chaos gives rise to populist demagogues, who prey on the ignorance and bigotry of the population to make a pitch for the throne. Such is the rebel leader, Jack Cade. We, John Cade, inspired with the spirit of putting down kings and princes, command silence. Valiant I am, I am able to endure much. I fear neither sword nor fire. Be brave then, for your captain is brave and vows reformation. When I am king, there shall be no more money. All shall eat and drink at my expense. And for the first three days of my reign, the pissing conduit shall run nothing but red wine. First thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. How <laughs> now? Who have you got there? The clerk of Chatham. He can read and write. Oh, monstrous. We caught him setting boys homework. Oh, here's a villain. He has a book in his pocket with red letters in it. Oh, then he's a conjurer. Come here, sir. I must question thee. What is thy name? Um, Emmanuel. <laughs> Emmanuel. Dost thou write thy name? Or do you sign it with a cross like a plain, ordinary man? Oh, sir, I, I thank God. I have been so well brought up that I can write my name. Deo gracias. Hang him. He's a traitor. He speaks French. Hanging with his pen and inkwell around his neck. Not a peer in the realm shall wear, it, wear his head unless he subject himself to me. She shall not have made be married, but she shall give to me her maidenhead ere they have it. Now away. Some to Westminster, some to the inns of court. Burn them all down. Destroy all the records of the realm. My mouth shall be the Parliament of England. It reminds me of somebody. I can't, I can't think of <laughs> So rebellion and civil war are uh, to be avoided, which means that order must be imposed until it reaches a tipping point where it becomes tyranny. As we see reflected in Julius Caesar, Richard III, Coriolanus, Macbeth, at what point does rebellion become reformation? It's always 
a delicate balance. In Julius Caesar, Brutus concludes, the abuse of greatness is when it disjoins remorse from power. By remorse, he doesn't mean regret, but pity. It's a sentiment echoed by Isabella in Measure for Measure. Oh, it is excellent to have a giant's strength, but it is tyrannous to use it like a giant. But man, proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven as make the angels weep. We're familiar now with the concept of justice being represented by a woman who is blindfolded, holding in her hand a pair of scales. This image was widely known in Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, and Rome. The blindfold indicated impartiality, but what do the evenly balanced scales represent? One hopes they might suggest a balance between justice and mercy. Justice is a, a cold and cerebral concept. Mercy, a warm-hearted and compassionate one. We saw that debate as recently as last December as to whether convicted criminals or refugees should be freed or kept in preventative detention. The debate was largely driven by racism and fear-mongering and became a political football. Could justice be tempered with compassion? One might dare to hope that here in our own country, the weight of the scales might be weighed between and balanced by mercy and compassion. And this is best depicted by Portia in The Merchant of Venice. She accepts that Shylock has the law on his side, but urges him to season justice with mercy. I like that word of the use of the word season. It is just something that adds relish or flavor to something that is cold and bloodless. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. It is mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throne and monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power then shows most like God's when mercy seasons justice. Thank you for your very kind attention. Thank you. My name is Susan Pond and I've got the privilege of being the president of the Royal Society of New South Wales, which has held the ideas at the house, this now being the ninth, in partnership with Her Excellency and Government House. So John, that was very much what we were hoping to achieve with this series. We've had uh, incredible expositions of uh, great science and tonight great literature, great acting. Thank you very much and I will thank you more formally in a few minutes. Bye. But we do have time for questions and I would like particularly to take questions from uh, some of the younger members of the audience. We have at least eight university students here. I, I was thinking about what you might say and therefore what questions to ask, but can you tell us uh, who you regard as the people who've given great speeches in real life, which have come somewhat close to Shakespeare, Shakespeare's figures, oh. and any in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> mm. uh, well, the people that spring to mind immediately, of course, are Winston Churchill, Abraham Lincoln. Um, Lincoln slaved over that Gettysburg Address for hours and hours to make it as perfect as possible. And uh, when he made that speech, uh, hardly anybody hear it. He had quite a high, thin voice, and uh, there's a big crowd, and only the people in the front row actually heard the Gettysburg Address. Thank God it was written down, and we now have it as a, you know, a great piece of oratory. And Churchill, of course, is renowned for his um, motivational power and, and uh, you know, example. Um, in modern politics, uh, a little harder to... <laughs> Sorry? 
Someone called out something? No? What about Boris Johnson, your, your perspective on Boris? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've never, sat through a, I've never sat through a Boris Johnson speech, so I don't, I don't know how to assess him. Um, I'd, I'd like to hear your opinion about who you think is a great modern speaker, but, uh, you know... Um, I, I don't think it's, it's been fashionable in recent times to appear too oratorical. It's been, don't, don't get too smart, you know. Uh, mm. the, the quip is mightier than the sword, you know. And no Australian examples of great oh. orators? Motivationals? I'm sure some of you will have answers to that. Some of them you regard as a great <laughs> speaker in Australian politics or, or society. Any, any offers? Yeah? You, you, uh, from your comments, I suppose that you quite like Well, it's interesting because he didn't regard himself as a good speaker. And he was quite embarrassed about it and said, I, I don't like doing it. It's, it's all bullshit. That's making oratorical speeches, you know. Uh, and I said, well, it's not... <laughs> I said, I was talking to him at the time. I said, if, if, you, if you mean it, if you believe it, it's not bullshit. It's just articulating your, your beliefs and your, you know, your ideas. So it's, it's not fake. It's not phony. The fact you're up there you know, you know, on a rostrum speaking... Uh, but he was much happier doing the one-liners from, uh, you know, the chamber and quick on his feet. He wasn't happy being oratorical, unlike Goff or Bob Menzies, for instance, who reveled in it. Does anyone in the audience have a microphone? Because we need to be able to hear. Have you ever thought of your comments about Mark Yes, and they seem to draw some parallel to... To Keating, you know, once he had the reins of power, he almost lost disinterest. He became disinterested. I'm just interested if you have an opinion on that. Well, I think the thing about Mark Antony is that it's, it's so devious. Uh, it, it's a complete bullshit. The whole speech. I uh, talked about being at, being there for Caesar's assassination. He, he, he was nowhere near it. He was away at the time. But he says, "I was there, and I saw this, and I saw that, and you know, gets the crowd all weeping. It, it's it's nonsense." And uh, showing them Caesar's will. But Caesar's will isn't, he hasn't got it. It's, it's back, back home. Um, Brutus sends for it later on. So the whole act is a, a masterful piece of oratory and stirring the audience up and turning their heads around within the space of five minutes, you know. But it's, it's phony. And that's the kind of thing that Keating was resisting, I think. Sir John, I, I draw a distinction between politicians who speak in pursuit of their own interests and statesmen who pursue the interests of their country or community. Is there a similar difference across Shakespeare? What, what, sorry, was there a... Uh, are there politicians and, sh and statesmen in Shakespeare? Politicians pursuing their own interests, statesmen pursuing the interests of their country? Yes, I, I, of course, yes. Um, I think um, the politician, Mark Antony, a supreme politician, and totally insincere, but convincing. Um, someone like Thomas More, who I read about the refugees, that's... It's, statesman-like speech. Um, but with others like Henry V, you've got to weigh up what is this for? What, what's, he, what, what's he got to gain out of making this? And I think it really is, it's highly motivational, but it's to his own ends. So um, there aren't that many um, people, I think, in Shakespeare, apart from Portia, that Mercy speech, for instance, is totally, um, you know, a, a totally... Uh, generous and not self-interested speech. I do think we can find examples, and we're going to have just as many examples of devious uh, politicians speaking in, in many of the plays. Christy Slade. I'm just back from Writers Week in Adelaide and was struck by two uses of Shakespeare. The first one was someone who's just in a, a, a biography of the young Rupert Murdoch and compared him to Henry V and his treatment in particular of his Rowan Rivette, his, his mentor, but the other one was a biography of Pétain, the leader of Vichy, who had been, um, uh, was on trial in the post-war period. And um, the author said, and it was shorthand for many, many things, you know, that he was a Lear figure, that, that his final interpretation was he was a Lear figure. The question that I'm asking is that shorthand works very well for many of us. Will it still keep working? Because I can tell you, oh, yeah. the, the audience at an Adelaide Writers' Week Festival is generally of our age. So how will it work for the next generation? 
Uh, look, I think a lot of it depends. <laughs> it depends on assessing the speaker's um, integrity and and uh, lack of self-interest, doesn't it? I mean, to listen to Donald Trump's speeches, they're all about you know. Um, playing to the crowd, playing to their prejudices and their ignorance and uh, um, making a weapon out of those? Um, or are they speaking from the heart that they really want to change things, they want to improve things, they want to make reforms? That's always tricky for us to judge, as, but that's what our, our job is as electors, is to pick the phonies from the, you know, the, true, the true, true coin and make a decision about our future, depending on the outcome of the election. That's, uh, it's always a, a challenge for us. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a great uh, disappointment that so many countries are um, sort of uh, apathetic about voting. I think, you know, what hope is there if uh, half the population doesn't even bother to vote? That's, is that a sign of despair or just uh, laziness? Or what does it mean? But it's, uh, it's, one can't hope for anything to improve unless everybody has, make, makes their voice heard. Wonderful speech. Thank you for that. Uh, um, there are some people these days who accuse Shakespeare of being a, a misogynist. Uh, that seems to me to be quite false because uh, uh, Shakespeare has demonstrated in so many cases his admiration and support for women. Could you comment on that? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I, I'm sort of guessing a bit here because I never met Shakespeare and I couldn't sort of analyze him face to face. You have to take it all from the, the words, the plays, and see what you can possibly winkle out of that. Uh, I would say that when he first started writing, um, he followed the tradition of women being um, a bit monstrous, a bit sort of uh, um, overbearing. So early plays like Titus Andronicus, for instance, and uh, Tamor of the Queen of the Goths, she's a really sort of tough figure, Joan of Arc in the Henry VI plays, a similarly uh, very um, male kind of aggressive figure. But uh, as it goes on, he softens them more and more, and I feel he wants to give women a voice, but it's hard in that society. Women don't have a voice, you know. So what he does, he puts them into male costume. They, the girls dis, dis, um, disguise themselves as men, uh, Viola, Rosalind, Portia. And when they do that, then they have a voice because they're in male attire and they are listened to so they can, you know, uh, start to rule the roost. Um, and I think he was trying to find a way of you know, liberating women. Uh, Dante Getty also had an all-male company. There were no women allowed on stage, so the roles were all played by men. Uh, and so doing that uh, gender swap was a, a big challenge for writers, and many of them didn't bother. You'd have you know, all male characters and maybe one female character because it was just too hard to, to write and uh, for the actors to impersonate women successfully. But Shakespeare must have had some fantastic actors in his company to, write, to play parts like Rosalind and Viola and Cordelia and, uh, you know, marvellous roles, the best roles for women ever written. So they were trained to um, do these female impersonations and to understand how women thought and behaved and uh, they are still, you know, unquestionably the, the roles that most women want to play. So they, they are convincing. Interesting with The Taming of the Shrew, which is often seen as a piece of misogynistic writing. I, I think it's, it's cleverer than that. It's, um, it's two people, both of them sort of mavericks, uh, very strong-willed, trying to negotiate how this marriage can work. And that's, of course, is a, you know, the basis of a lot of sitcom and comedy from, from way back the male-female uh, battle for superiority. And uh, I think in the, in the Taming of the Shrew, we see um, concessions being made on both sides, and these, these two mavericks work out a way of living together. Other people think they're crazy. They think they're, they're you know, nutcases. But they do work out their own way. We can negotiate a way of living together to keep us both happy. And I think that's the message of that play, that uh, you have to negotiate. You have to give a little, take a little, but nobody should feel, I am on top. Judith Wielden. <coughs> oh, thank you. I got, got a bit of the wind taken out of my sails because my question was going to be about feminism <laughs> and is Shakespeare a feminist? 
I think I'll just make a really quick argument that he is and see how you might respond. Um, as you very well know, at that time, women were very largely packages to be passed around for their financial, dynastic, um, political value. Um, and so they were very, fairly stereotyped roles. But then in Richard III, he has the women who do their curses and their lamentations and who come back as very, very strong women, making their argument about the way women are treated and standing up for themselves in their own rights. Um, there's Lady Macbeth, who's a very, very strong woman. Not a nice one, as, as many of the others aren't, as you've already said. But we get Desdemona and Juliet and Beatrice, whom I th think he gives voices um, that are very strong. These women are equal to anybody else in Shakespeare's plays. They're articulate, they're intelligent, they understand their position in the society and the lack of power. Um, but I'll come back to Portia. Beautiful speech. We all learn it in high school. But I think she's actually quite an evil character in the play. I'm sorry? I think she's quite an evil character. She's not, she talks about these Christian virtues, and she's not Christian at all. That's she's the one Christian. of the most Machiavellian of <laughs> his characters. And she gets away with it. And everybody thinks she's a heroine because she's so articulate and so intelligent. But, you know, she'll deceive you as to who she is. She cross-dresses, she pretends, she's a liar. And when she talks about the quality of mercy, she doesn't even season it when she actually makes her judgment on Shylock. He's destroyed by her. Which leads me to Machiavelli. I thought you might talk about... My question will be is... Uh, Machiavelli and Shakespeare's lives were almost congruent in different languages, though. What do you think? Do you believe that he read Machiavelli? Oh, yes. Because there, yes. there's some debate about Yeah, Good, because yes. I think yeah. he did, too. He had to have. Um, can you talk about the influence of Machiavelli as seen in the plays? Yeah, just a little, yes. Um, he knew he was Machiavelli. Richard III quotes as, I shall become a Machiavelli. Mm. A Machiavelli meant a villain in yeah. common parlance. He was that well known by reputation. If people hadn't read him, they knew all about you know, his, his uh, philosophy. So Machiavelli was, was very, very common. Um, as for Portia being evil, I think it's often misread uh, as a romantic comedy. I think it's not. I think it's a satire about the law and money and class and race. And um, it's, it's very hard, tough play, I think. And it's not a romantic comedy at all. She has to save Antonio's life because Antonio is in love with Bassanio and has this uh, hold on him. And if she can't break that bond between them, then Bassanio will always be in debt to, to Antonio if Antonio sacrifices his life. So she has to break that bond and Save, Shil uh, save Antonio. Her destruction of Shylock, well, you can say it's, she's merciless, but Shylock brings it on himself by insisting on the letter of the law. Uh, absolutely literal. He, he's offered so many ways out and says, no, I insist on the letter. And she says, okay, if you want the letter of the law, this is it. Um, and that's, that's, bad. That, that will, that's tough, but it's, it's you know, believable. It gets one step worse when uh, 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 Antonio adds, and also he must become a Christian, uh, which I think is the, the worst thing to happen to Shylock. It takes away his culture, his, his, his whole identity. Um, that, that's the, the cruelest thing they do to him, I think. And I think it's a satire about race. I mean, Portia despises anybody who's not Venetian. She makes wisecracks about the English, the French, the Italians. None of them are good enough. You've got to be a Venetian, a white Venetian. And, uh, so, uh, for which you can read Londoner, I suppose. And I think it, it's, it's very much about um, hypocrisy, Christian hypocrisy, in the way they yeah, treat the Jews. Example. Yeah. And, um, but there's no... Nobody's either really good or evil, I think, in any of Shakespeare's People plays. Yeah, yeah. Really she, certainly is, she certainly is a trickster, uh, and she gets what she wants. She chooses the man she wants, and... Uh, marries him, and then saves his friend. 
I suppose a little, a little example of that is her father has decreed that uh, her portrait is in one of three caskets, gold, silver, and lead. And whoever chooses the right casket with her portrait can claim her as his wife. All the other suitors choose gold or silver because that's obviously the only worthy vessel for such a divine creature. But Sonia chooses lead, and that's the right one because the father's message is all that glitters is not gold, you know, and don't go by outward appearances. But I don't think Bassanio does it by himself. I think she helps him over the line. Sure, she, yes. she calls for music. And the, the, the music, the singer comes on and sings, tell me, where is fancy bread? In the heart or in the head? How be got? How nourish Ed? So, like saying, dummy, it's in the lead one. <laughs> <laughs> and he, so he picks it. And so that's how she chooses her husband and defies her father's will. I think that's a piece of clever trickery. And, and you know, uh, she always gets her own way. And uh, she's admirable in many ways, but as, she's, as, as I said also, uh, she's tough and she you know, doesn't give any ground. And I think the other thing about Shakespeare's women is that uh, as he progresses, they become the moral uh, exemplars. When we get to people like um, um, uh, the Queen in, uh, oh God. Um, Titania? <laughs> no, no, no. Um, oh. <sighs> slipped my mind. But the women become the strong characters, the moral example, like Cordiglia, for instance, uh, is the, the, has the moral strength in that play. Um, um, I wish I could think of that other one that I'm trying to think of, but, you know, memory's going. Uh, and Lady Macbeth, I don't think, is all that bad a character. She wants to be. She summons up evil spirits to make her tough, but in fact she can't go through with it. She can't carry out the murder. And shortly after, she starts to fall to pieces. Once Macbeth you know, goes on, it goes rogue, she's, she, she starts falling apart and finally goes insane and commits suicide. So Macbeth gets tougher and tougher, and she goes more and more desiccated. So she's not as tough as she'd like to be. You think he gets tougher? Judith, I'm going to have to go <laughs> to the back for two more questions, and then we can continue the conversation later. So we've got yeah. one up the back, Excellent. two up the back, and then we will we'll need to stop for more informal conversation. Excellent. Thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. Uh, Shakespeare has obviously contributed greatly to Western culture and culture in general. And the one thing that is of great concern to me is that young people are failing to engage with not just his works, but the great works. For most young people, Shakespeare, the most experience they have with him is year 10 English. And there's nothing beyond that. And I distinctly remember that the way that we had to even learn about Shakespeare was they had to water it down through The Lion King, which is obviously based off of Hamlet. So how do you get young people to engage and not let his works be forgotten? Look, that's been a problem for quite a long time, I think. When I was at school, you know, there weren't many kids who responded well to Shakespeare. We had a wonderful English teacher uh, and gave us all he could. And uh, only two or three of us really responded to it. Uh, otherwise, we water off a duck's back, you know. And I think that's common with a lot of young people. I think the best way is to see a really good performance that really inspires you and you want to know more about it. Teaching Shakespeare is very hard, especially when you pass the book around the room and everybody reads a line or something. And they, mm, kill it like that, you know. The only way is through performance, really, which is why Bell Shakespeare has a, an education company playing around the schools and talking to the kids and, you know, showing different ways you can perform characters. But that's the only way, I think, is to bring it to life. Um, you can get the kids on their feet performing it in a production. That's often exciting for them to feel the thrill of acting it, but not just passing the book around. That's, that's awful. Um, but uh, it's, it's true of most of our great literature. It's getting more and more uh, fading into the past. The, recently, they did uh, The Importance of Being Earnest at the Sydney Theatre Company, and a lot of it was translated because they thought this language is too archaic for a modern audience. Oscar Wilde, too archaic, you know. That's when I get worried, when <laughs> it catches up with us, you know. Say one last question. Hi, um, I'm a social work student from the University of Sydney. I'm in my final year, and I suppose social work is inherently a political um, profession, and we're working with people who are experiencing the most micro experience of um, the big politics that you discussed. Um, with your teachings um, that Shakespeare has imparted on you with leadership and politics more widely, what sort of advice would you give to social workers going into a field um, that's flooded with the political issues um, on how to um, engage in that sort of work with 
the teachings that you found in Shakespeare? Like, what sort of advice could you give to social workers going out into that field? Mm. I really haven't followed the question terribly easily. Sorry, <laughs> I can phrase it so better if that would help. Advice to, to people going into in social, social work, work, which is a political profession yeah, in, yeah. The, in her view. Well, I think one of the greatest things um, and necessary things about acting is that you have to listen and empathise and walk in somebody else's shoes. You know, you have to take on that character to... You mightn't uh, like the character, say, like Richard III, but you have to understand where he's coming from, why he's so, um, you know, screwed up. Uh, so I think a lot of it is about empathy. Uh, and you can find a lot of that in Shakespeare, as in other works, of course, but um, it's there to be found and discussed and, you know, how would you approach this character? What is their problem? What is their... What's weighing them down? How do we... How do you help that character? Is, is that a sort of... No, that's thing wonderful. You're that's actually perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Great answer. And I just thought of that Queen's name. It's Hermione in The Winter's Tale. That's, I was trying to think of that. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, she's greatly wronged by her husband. He's, he's a jealous, uh, um, psychotic, crazy man. And uh, he, he, con he uh, condemns her. Uh, and she apparently dies. In fact, she goes into... Um, secrecy for 14 years and in that 14 years he recovers and gets his mind back and then she forgives him which is extraordinary um, after all he's done to her so I think the women become as I said the strong moral compasses in those last in the tragic plays and some of the comedies as well they teach men a lot and that's in a lot of the comedies the women teach the men Rosalind teaches Orlando what love is really all about and uh, you know for instance so they become the wise characters, and then they become the compassionate ones and the, the models of integrity. In that, to the extent, yes, he's a feminist. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, we'll give you a break, if you wouldn't mind taking Certainly. your yes. seat and your water, which you uh, probably need. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. The applause says it all. John is the ninth star in our Ideas in the House uh, firmament, and he has really given us, through the lens of Shakespeare's scepticism and prodigious insights into life, that a man from the 1500s is a man for today. And to the questions from the, uh, from the back about how do we get Shakespeare into the minds of our younger generations? It's essential that we do. We must clearly, uh, clearly work out how to do that. I think Shakespeare, I believe that Shakespeare would heartily approve of uh, our society, which spans the sciences and humanities, and this series, Ideas at the House, which has a very broad sweep. Remember, Shakespeare was alive before the formation of most of the learned societies that, with which we're familiar today. He was, in my mind, a one-man forerunner of many of the learned societies, including the Royal Society of New South Wales. I believe even more firmly that Shakespeare would heartily approve of John Bell. He's shown us tonight why he is such an illustrious theatre personality, why he has been a major influence on the development of Australian and international theatre during his lifetime, and may you continue for many more years, John. I'm coming to uh, hear and listen to you at the uh, Sydney Symphony Orchestra performance. It's coming up very soon. John is an award-winning actor, acclaimed director, a risk-taking impresario, much like Shakespeare, passionate educator, inspiring leader, and an unforgettable speaker. Please join me once again in thanking John for treating us to a rare and unforgettable experience.